All right, ladies and gentlemen, and children, and all ages and all that good stuff. We've got a, a lot for you today. Growing resilience with Todd Dwyer and Scott Hambrick. We've got a Duracoat finished firearm for you. Talk about Brownells bullet points and a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit everywhere. That's going to be a good day. So uh, buckle up and stay tuned. Shooting at the gun rate, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Markle, and the shipping ogre, Zach Markle. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. We got, we got more effing snow. Oh, we got free water. Don't you guys out in the... Yep, yep, it's true. It's true. And I'm, I'm writing this down, and I'm taking note... And if come June, somebody in government starts squawking about mama, 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 drought and make sure it's like, I'm, there's going to be. I actually had a realization. Smacks. Smack I had a realization people. about the drought stuff the other day. Mm. I think that part of the problem is that like in the big city areas, I think they're doing it in the smaller town areas too. But I know for sure in the big city areas, they're taking a lot of the water that would normally be in the ground. Like when you drill a well, you could hit water, right? Yeah. They're taking a lot of that and they're putting it into pipes so that so that humans can access it easier, which is all good and, and everything until the ground is no longer no longer has the water that it needs. So well, I'm wondering if that is part of the problem that leads to the drought <laughs> where now we're getting so much snowpack. Right, and we've got a, a a ton of snow, which will turn into a ton of water. Which is going to is the problem? Cry about it. They're like too yeah, much is water. Is the problem but, that we've we've taken all that instead of drilling wells and using wells for water, we've taken it and put it into piping, which goes faster. Like it it dissipates faster because mm, people can use it easier. I don't think so. Uh, well, I can tell you what the problem is. It's really easy. It's a desert, and. People, you're not supposed to put 3 million people in one spot in a desert. That's the problem. Uh, right. You, saying, the well, you know, you, you know, we got this problem with the drought. And it's like, right, California, they're always crying about water. And they don't, they're not crying now, but they're always crying about, you know, water restrictions and water and blah, blah, blah. 70 years ago, 80 years ago, they had drought problems when there were like 50 less than 50% of the people that are there now. No, as humans, we, we, nobody knows when to say when no one needs to put, you know, it's well, nobody can put their foot on the brake and say, Hey, you know what? This is actually a desert and we don't get a lot of rainfall here. So we, but humans need water. So we probably shouldn't put 3 million people into one small geographic area and expect them to use the amount of water that we were using for 200,000 people 30 years ago. It's not hard science. And, and the, but the whole thing with the, with the, the, the drought and the, and the water restrictions and all that is they, nobody practices what they preach. The government's the government entities all have huge fountains and lush green lawns, and every city building has a lush green lawn in front of it. And in the desert, there's only the only way to keep a lush green lawn is to water it constantly. Uh, but they look out at the people; it's crisis politics. But at the same time, if they would, you know, if they would be honest, say, you know what, we don't need this many people here, but they do. You know why they want that many people there? Because of tax revenue. Because tax yeah. revenue gives politicians power. The more tax revenue, the more money they have control over. The more money that they control, the more power that they have. That's why they'll never say, you know what? We don't need any more people in this valley. We've got enough. We're full. We, we don't have enough water for all the people, so stop coming. No, they'll never do that. They'll never do there, that because they get actually, the money. There's actually a city here that put a moratorium on building because there were too many people. Well, so good. Doing that. Well, good. They, more the, of them need to the do The reason that. that I thought about the well thing is because I know people personally that have wells drilled in their property and they no longer have water. So they have to, they have to get somebody to come out or the water they themselves drops. have to dr drill deeper to hit right. water. Cause the water table. And I was like, well, why would that be? Is it because we're not getting enough water and snowpack and all that stuff that feeds the Valley 
or are we do we are there too many people and the process of delivering water is fast enough where it it's being consumed faster than it is uh, being replaced well you know you know if if you want to get into science there's this this there's the same amount of water on planet earth today as there was on day one they're like no there's not we're running out of water where did it go this is you know this is like junior high science 101 junior high science 101 water is always in one of three forms right it's either frozen, it's gaseous, or it's liquid. And it moves around planet Earth. And it always has since the beginning of time. People who say retarded things like, we're running out of water. Where did it go? Did it, did it float away into outer space? Did it leave planet Earth? Did it somehow escape the planet? No, there's the same amount of water on planet Earth today as there was. It's in different places and it's in different forms, but there's the same amount. But, you know, we do those, we do these things. We, we, and we're going to talk. <laughs> if you stick around and listen, uh, we're going to talk to our, our, our friend Scott and our new friend Todd about sustainability and about how we created a situation where it, it, you know that's it's our survival so, you know we didn't talk about it because could quite frankly we, there's so many things to talk about but um uh, jared if you you have studied enough with ready man right um about how many calories are you burning hunting a rabbit right oh yeah yeah so like People are like, oh, I'm going to live, you know, and if anything ever happens, I'm going to survive on rabbits and squirrels. I'm like, okay. You have a rabbit farm currently because if you don't and you plan on hunting those things, good luck, man. Yeah. How many calories do you burn? Do you use up harvesting a rabbit versus how many calories you get back in? Unless you can set up a situation where you're getting bringing in more calories and you're burning, you're in a deficit economy. You're in a deficit calorie economy. And right now on planet Earth, we are in a we're running a deficit calorie economy where we're spending more calories than we are creating. Right? And something's going to have to change. You're like, oh no, everything's fine. I went to the grocery store yesterday, and there was there was plenty of food. There was so much food. I want, I like, okay, whatever. Uh, we're and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that today. But before we do that, before we do that, uh, Zachary and Jared, if there's if there's questions in the Discord, if you're watching on Discord right now, uh, as you always can be, uh, if you sto- if you join, if you go to studentofthegun.com slash Discord. You can get into our Discord public uh, group, and you can chat with liberty-minded individuals, and you can find out when we're going to do the show live, and all of those good things. So that is that is a benefit for you. But before we go any farther, let's take a moment and acknowledge those who make this show possible, and one of those uh, companies is a company called Duracoat. All right, we're going to talk about colors and such, but uh, the main thing I wanted to talk about today is I think there there may be, uh, there's still some trepidation out there, or may, perhaps you're a new guy or a new listener or a recent listener, and you're like, I don't, but yeah, I know that there are people that have shops, professional guys, and, and so forth that do that, but I'm just an average person, and I've never done that before, so I don't know what to do. Okay, fine. If you feel like you are in a position where you're unqualified or you do not have the correct amount of information, that's okay. That's okay because everybody's there where everybody's a beginner once, right? Student for life. So what you can do and what you should do is just pop over to DuracoatFirearmFinishes.com. Not only do they have all of the stuff, but here's what they have. They have... if. If you go to the website and you, you, you're afraid to talk to humans in person, if you go to the website, there's actually a little pop-up window and it says, Texas says, hi, do you have a question? 
And you say, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And you enter that question and they will do their best to help you. Now, if you are absolutely stuck, let's say you've bought whatever it is, slightly darker, black, World War II, olive drab, uh, whatever, but you're stuck or you feel like you need some clarity, you can call them and say, hello, I am a customer and I need some help. And here's what I can tell you. They will do their app, their family run business, family founded, family owned, family run business. And they will do their absolute best to aid and assist you. Now, if you would like to be really good, if you'd like to be really good at Dura coding, if you'd like to do fantastic jobs that people envy, uh, well, go to studentofthegun.com slash Duracoat. And what that will do is that will take you directly to Duracoat University. It is a distance learning online program uh, that you can get into. They, they, it's not just notional. They actually will, when you sign up, they will send you actual physical material that you can use to physically create the projects that you're going to be doing. So fear not. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and the other thing, well, if you've been here for a while and you love us and you should, um, the question is, would you want an official student of the gun blue? Would you? Would you endorse that? Would you buy that? Was that something that you think would be a great idea to go with the official student of the gun, slightly darker black? Because we know those folks up there, they're good people, and uh, hello, Bert and everybody else at the in the Duracoat shops who's listening. Uh, I told him I was like, you know, every time this show comes out, you need to put it on the speakers out there in the in the plant so everyone can listen. <laughs> and they smile and they're like, sure. I'm like, I'm not kidding. Do I look like I'm joking? <laughs> uh, but at very least, everyone at Duracoat should be have their iPods in or their i. Is it iPods? Yeah, the little white things that hang out of your ears, uh, and be listening to the show every week. So support them. They support us. They're good people. And uh, if, if nothing else, uh, when you talk to them, say, hey, student of the gun sent you. All right. Uh, last week, if you didn't hear it last week, uh, what we did is we played for you. We played the, the update from the president of High Point Firearms, who was letting you know uh, that they are working just as hard as they possibly can to get the new YC-9, uh, the Yeet Cannon, the new one with the double stack magazine and the threaded barrel, and uh, all, and it's I believe it's also going to be optic ready. Isn't that correct here? Yeah, it's going to be optic ready. Uh, you'll be able to put a red dot on it uh, very easily, all that good stuff. They're working just as hard as they possibly can to get that ready and get it out. But in the meantime, why don't you go ahead and pick up a 10-millimeter pistol while you're at it? You can do that. You can do that. It's called the JXP-10. Uh, it is a big, beefy sucker, uh, and uh, it's available right now for MSRP less than $300. What? Yep. So we're, we're just going to call this the gateway drug of 10 millimeters. <laughs> if you're looking for a gateway drug, you're looking way to get into the 10 mil game but you don't have a thousand dollars to spend on a gun fear not go to your local retailer and tell them i want the high point 10 millimeter pistol sell it to me and i will give you money and generally gun dealers when you say if you will sell that to me i will give you money they will smile and nod and they will sell that to you and take your money <laughs> isn't that great how that works isn't that great how capitalism works? Yes, indeed. Juxi, J-U-X-X-I dot com. Uh, reminder, yes, the, uh, the new algorithm, the new Google slash YouTube algorithm has decided that if you assemble, if you put, if you thread a suppressor onto a gun, then you are breaking the law somehow. And you're like, no, I'm not. That's. What are you talking about? Yes, but if you do that, then what the YouTube algorithm is going to do is it's going to shut you down and and strike you. They will strike you down. 
Well, you know where you can go so you don't have to deal with that crap? Uh, Juxi.com, J-U-X-X-I. It is a video platform uh, that is open and available to you. You just have to follow the rules set up, and you don't have to worry about the new, the latest Google algorithm flagging you for community standard violation for displaying weapons. Arr. Or you can just keep doing what you're doing on YouTube and eventually they will catch up to you and then they will shut you down and then you will cry and you will say, I'm so sad and everyone should be bad for me because they shut down my channel. And I'm not going to cry and I'm not going to feel bad for you because we told you what you could do and what you should do to prevent that from happening. So if you have a gun tube channel and uh, you wake up one morning and get a, and have a nasty gram from YouTube saying how you violated their standards and now you're not allowed to do it anymore. Well, surprise, not really, not really surprised because we told you it was coming. Uh, and Jared, Jared, as Jared has said, and I'll say it for him because he, uh, is it's not an only, it's an also. People are like, well, I have my stuff on Facebook and I have my stuff on YouTube and I have my stuff on whatever. I don't want to take it off there. That's cool. No one told you you had to shut down your YouTube account. Don't worry. Eventually, Google will just shut it down for you. You don't have to shut it down yourself. Uh, and if you already have an established YouTube account, you can set up your Juxy account and just migrate all your videos over. Isn't that right, Jared? Is that not true? Yep, super easy. You just create your Juxy account, juxy.com, create the account, and then you can import the entire YouTube library over there. And, uh, and then your content's safe. We create copies of the video. So if you put one on Juxy and you imported it from YouTube and then you delete the video from YouTube or it gets removed because of community service file or community service, community standards violations the video will still be on Juxy, so your content will be safe. Yes. So at least go over, create an account, import your videos, make a safe haven for your content. Absolutely. I don't know about you guys, but I've been creating content for a long time. And as someone who's created content for a long time, one of the things that I hate and detest is to have to redo work that I've already done. Do you like to redo work that you've already done? I don't. I I absolutely despise it. So uh, wouldn't you hate to have like 100 hours of video content and then have YouTube just arbitrarily scrub it and make it go away? You're like, yeah, but I've, I've got all the hard drives and stuff like you want to go back and re-edit and re-upload everything. How long did it take you to upload 100 hours of stuff? You're like, uh, yeah, that's a lot. So just do yourself a favor. Get over to Juxi.com, J-U-X-X-I.com. Do it now and, uh, you know, cry now or cry later or, you know, whatever. Pain now or pain later or whatever. <laughs> All right. If you're a new listener, and I'm glad you're here. Good job. Glad you're here. If you're a new listener, perk up your ears, close that hole under your nose, and pay close attention to what's about to happen. Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Yes, indeed. That's exactly what you should do. You should do that. I recommend it. All right. Every week, there's a, uh, a company that sponsors a little thing called Brownells Bullet Points. They're called Brownells, and uh, they are in Grinnell, Iowa. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with your Iowa geography, uh, you just get on Interstate 80 and you head east or you head west, either way, um, depending on where you start. Yeah. and you will run into Grinnell, pop off the exit, and you will find Brownells. You're like, well, yeah, but but they're they're an online. No, they are online, but they have a huge, monstrous, gigantic showroom, gun shop. It's a gun shop. It's a part shop. It's everything you need. 
If you find yourself going east or west on Interstate 80 through Iowa, take the time to jump off of the Grinnell exit. Uh, it's a monstrous building that says Brownells on the outside of it, so it's kind of hard to miss. Um, if you're coming from the east, though, you pass the exit first, then you see the big building, and you're like, oh, there it is. Then you have to get off on the next exit, turn around, and come back. But if you're coming from the west, you see the building first, then you get off on the exit. That's how that works. Uh, but check out our good friends at Brownells, and uh, they'll be happy to see you. Uh, the topic of the day, ammunitions. Yes, indeed. Well, come on, Paul. We, already, we, we get it. Um, I This weekend, I decided to conduct a little experiment. I went to a, a large, uh, not the biggest, Real but... Quick. We didn't actually play the music. Oh, we got to play the Brownells intro music. Yeah, do that. But a bump. Now it's official. Uh, now it's official. Yeah, official Brownells bullet points music. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I was uh, in the Salt Lake Valley this weekend just for a little bit, and I decided I was going to conduct an experiment. Uh, I went to a large gun shop. I went to a large gun shop, and I asked them to purchase black powder. Now, you're like, black powder? Like, all powder's black or grayish. It's all grayish or black. No, no, I mean, I mean black powder, like the powder that produces smoke, because uh, I do muzzleloading. I, I enjoy muzzleloading uh, very much. I have a flintlock Kentucky rifle. Or that's actually, or is it, no, it's a Pennsylvania, is it a Pennsylvania long rifle? Yeah, it's a Pennsylvania long rifle, 50 caliber flintlock. And you cannot and you should not attempt to use, quote, modern smokeless powders and something like that. Because if you do, you're going to fail miserably. It's going to be a bad, it's going to be a bad day. Well, went in, asked them, and the guy's like, well, I'll have to go back to the powder locker because smokeless powder, eh, not smokeless powder, uh, black powder has to be kept in a powder locker. They don't just stick it on the counter. Uh, you will not find it sitting on a counter in a gun shop. You have to ask for it. If you don't know that, you're you're like, yeah, I, I go to my place. I looked, and, and they didn't have it. I'm like, yeah, they did. They had it in a designated powder locker somewhere else. And he said to me, he goes, well, I'm going to have to check because I don't know how much we have because we haven't been getting it. I said, oh. Okay, uh, and and it comes in different grades. There's there's single F. It's measured by single F, double F, triple F, and then the really fine stuff that we, you you would use just in a in a flash pan or in a, it would be four F. I don't ever use four F. Uh, I generally just use single F is like for uh, muskets or cannon or whatever. But I use two or three. Long story short, he came back out. He said, "Hey, I've got two, two." Uh, containers of 3F. Do you want them both? And I said, well, since you took the time to go all the way back to the powder locker, the answer is yes, I will take them off of your hands. Is that anecdotal? You're like, ah, that's just your shop. That doesn't, that's not indicative of the whole world. I don't know whether it is or not. My question to you would be, is that indicative? Have Are you guys out there, or any of you guys out there, muzzle-loading guys, uh, you're like, oh, I just get the stuff from Walmart. I get the, the Pyrodex or whatever. I hate Pyrodex. I just do. If I'm going to, if I'm going to muzzle load, I'm going to use pure black powder. I don't like the Pyrodex. I don't like the, the substitutes. They're just as dirty and they rust, uh, and black powder, a, hey, it, to me, it's, it's, it's the true thing. So if you are a muzzle loading guy, and you haven't purchased powder in a while? Because I know a lot of you guys, you're like, I buy one can a year or one can every two years, and I keep it fresh, and I don't worry about it. You might want to check with your local dealer. And, and well, you know, Jared, uh, one of the anecdotes is the sm small shops generally don't carry it. I went to one, and uh, they're like, yeah, we don't carry that. You have to order it. And, and can you order it? Yes, you can order it. As an American, you can order it and have it delivered to you, but you will have to pay a uh, over-the-road hazardous material uh, delivery charge plus shipping. And that's usually like 30 to 40 bucks 
for the hazmat shipping plus regular shipping. So you end up paying more in shipping than the unit actually costs itself. And to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so now is the time. Check your powder. Check your powder supplies. And when you get powder, put that in a container that is airtight, watertight, and they, you don't have to worry about it getting wet or moist or whatever. Uh, sometimes moist is good and sometimes it's not. The time to buy ammo is yesterday. If you go to Brown Elf, you're like, well, does Brown Elf sell black powder? Mm, I don't think they do. I'm sure. Let's go ahead and look. I don't remember if they have actual black powder or not. Brown, black, 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 black powder. Uh, I see muzzle loading propellant, but I don't see any black powder. Black. Yeah, I, I, hit, I clicked black powder and I got, uh, here we go. Uh, black horn powder. Uh, what is black horn powder? High performance muzzle loader propellant engineered for modern inline, but it's his black horn muzzle loading propellant. I bet you that's like a triple seven or a pyrodex or something like that. If you want black powder, uh, generally go X is, is the way to go. Uh, and I don't believe they sock it because the, the fact is it is a hazardous material and you do have to pay for has, hazmat shipping fees. And most people, you can do it, but most people aren't going to. You know, if you're paying $24 for a pound and it's $37 hazardous material shipping fee, you're like, mm. but regular ammunition, they still are listing the what they're calling the ammo blowout. They have, they're running sales on 22 10 mil, 10 millimeter, uh, Celier and below, Celier and below ammunition that you can put in your JXP. Uh, PMC 556 is on sale. Uh, the 57 by 28, which, did we talk about that being the cartridge? Um, of the we show did, but i don't remember if it was on air or if it was off air yeah every year when i when i go to shot tour every time i go to shot show i i pay attention because there's there's always trends there are trends in calibers and chamberings um you know one year it seemed like everybody who was making rifles was making a 338 like all of a sudden everybody had a 338 lapua and then uh, you know, I went another year and all of a sudden everybody had a compact 380. Everyone was introducing a new compact 380 or whatever. So th- we have these trends, six, five Creedmoor. A few years ago, what, four or five years ago, everyone had a six, five Creedmoor. Ruger, Savage, Remington, Mossberg, name it. Everybody had a six, five Creedmoor. So that is a, it, it's a trend. We see trends. And the trend this year was 5.7, 5.7 by 28, which is kind of weird because it's been around for a while, and it's been around so long that it's kind of weird that it's being treated as if it's a new thing because it's not really new. Uh, FN was making a 5.7 pistol over 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, maybe 15. I'm not sure how long ago it's been since the F- FN 5.7 pistol. Uh, but it's out there, and it's available, and now Smith & Wesson has one, and Ruger has one, and FN obviously had, um, has them, um, and PS Arms, PSA has one, and kel has one. kel actually has a couple of different ones. Um, so, yeah, the 5.7. Uh, I actually looked into a couple of years ago. It was two years ago. Uh, they were running barn burner discounts on the Ruger 5.7 pistol. And I thought, man, that would be a good close-up varmint, like for shooting prairie dogs and varmints and stuff within 25 yards. That'd be a, that'd be a great cartridge. And the price on the pistol was was price to move. I was like, oh, that's a good price. Then I realized that you couldn't get ammo because two years ago you couldn't buy a round of five seven, and if you could find it, it was two bucks a shot. And I was like, uh, I'm not going to shoot desert rats for two bucks a shot. Sorry. So I just passed. Well, it's not two bucks a shot anymore. It's about 75 cents a shot. 
uh, when you find it, but it is out there and it is available. So if that's your bag, man, if that's something you're into, uh, well, then get on it. Get on it. If you're really serious about uh, ammunitions, uh, you can purchase a steel drum of 762 by 51 NATO for $9,999. That would be 7,500 rounds, and it comes with a drum that you can reuse. I mean, who doesn't need a steel drum, right? Um, <laughs> if you don't need that much, you, you can get it by the box or the case. <laughs> but they do have a steel drum. Remember... About five, six years ago when, when Brownells was offering steel drums of 5.56 five, and people laughed. All right, I'd never want that much. And then 2020 rolled around and I was like, oh, that would have been. If I'd have bought one of those back then, that, that would have been a pretty smart investment. Yeah, yeah, it would have. Yeah, it would have. So now is the time. The time is now. Go to your ammo locker and do an inventory and do what you, you know, you're an American, do whatever you think your career can handle. And people are like, well, how much should I buy? I'm like, I don't know. How much are you going to shoot? Are you planning to train at all this summer, this spring, this next year? Do you want to train during this next year? Yes, you do. Then the time to purchase ammunition for that endeavor is now. Not April, not May, not June, now. Because uh, now it's because you guys want a little, let me let you in on a little secret. All the normies, the average gun owner, the, the, you know, the dabblers, they're all involved in other stuff mentally right now. They're worried about the stupid bowl and, and, sports ball and it's cold and they just got out of Christmas and so they're not shooting and so they're not even thinking about it so the prices that the the volume is coming up and the prices are coming down now the price there if you're waiting for 2019 prices if you're waiting to pay 17 cents a shot for nine ball and then you're going to buy it I don't think it's going to happen I could be wrong it happened once before but I I don't see that happening. If you're waiting for 20 cent 556 to pop around, it's not going to happen. Now, something that I did notice when I did my little browsing and shopping uh, this weekend is that uh, there was tons of ammunition on the shelves in the gun shops, but that crap is full. Oh, wow. Well, I, I went in there with Nancy and she's like, she goes, well, what are the prices like? And I'm like, it makes it hurts my stomach. It hurts my tummy to look. Uh, the shops, I, I don't know, Jared. Is is it they just can't compete, so they don't even try the shops because? All right, I'll, I'll give you a great no example. Idea. They had both. Well, we know the one that we did the instructor development class at. That one was actually pretty good pricing. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the. Yeah, the, the, uh, we don't need to say it, but the one that I went to, they had bulk 9 mil, and their bulk price for 9 mil ball was $0.44 cents a shot. That's not... Oh, wow. No thanks. Because you can get it online right now for right around $0.25 cents a shot. If you buy it in case lots, uh, and if you watch, if you pay attention, a lot of these people, if you buy a case, they'll give you free shipping. Yeah. Uh, so you say, well, the the difference between twenty five cents and forty four cents is not a big deal. It is when you're using when you're buying five hundred rounds. Um, uh, so the ammo is there. This is what I'm gonna tell you: it's there, it's available. The old, you know, the the stuff from two years ago. People are like, I can't find ammo. I can't find it. I don't know where you guys are finding ammo. No, ammo's there. Now, you just have to ask yourself, am I willing to pay the price for it? And that's, that's, that's an individual thing. And the last thing I'm going to say is this. If you're listening to me in the United States of America right now, you need to understand that the United States of America is the only country in the world where shooting and firearms ownership 
and the ability to just say, you know what, today I'm going to take my guns and go shoot them. We're the only country where the peasantry, where the common man can do that. Every other country in the world, the shooting sports is reserved for the ruling class elite and the wealthy because they're the only ones that can afford to do it. Understand this. In the United States of America, we are the only country where the common man can readily at any time, day or night, decide to enjoy that freedom. Everywhere else, it's tremendously restricted and it's expensive. And we've gotten a little bit spoiled. Uh, you know, when you talk, if you if you meet a foreigner, if you meet someone from Europe or any other country where they're allowed by their masters to shoot guns, and they find out how much we pay for ammo, they're like, "It's like you guys are stealing it." So. Uh, Understand that I know, you know, you're looking at the price and you're like, man, I don't want to spend that much. From a, a realistic standpoint or practical standpoint, it's still way less than you would have to pay anywhere else. So keep that up in mind. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on from the Brownells bullet points. Remember to thank those guys right into the Crossbreed Holsters. Uh, Crossbreed Holsters uh, is the student of the gun homeroom brought to you by Crossbreed. And uh, we're going to talk about resilience and being dangerous on demand and being prepared and all that. It's going to be a good time. Make sure that when you do go to crossbreedholsters.com, use the promotional code SOTG. Save money on their high-quality made-in-America products. You will not regret it. The next voices you hear will be Jared and mine and Zachary's and Scott and Todd. All right, here we are. Welcome back to another Student of the Gun Live. Well, it's live for you if you're listening right now. If you're not listening right now, then it's not live for you, but whatever. It doesn't matter. What's important is that you're here and we're here, and that makes it our time. So now that we're here with our time, I'm going to let Jared, who uh, who kind of uh, arranged this, uh, he arranged this situation. And so the reason I say that is if if everything goes wrong, you can just blame Jared for that. <laughs> so we've got Todd Dwyer and Scott Hambrick on with us. Uh, thank you guys, Scott. I appreciate you joining us and Todd, thank you as well. You. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for having us on. Zach, we're going to go ahead and roll the crossbreed holsters homeroom audio. We'll do the opening video here because I think that one of the most important, I could say a cornerstone of being dangerous on demand is having independence. And uh, these gentlemen are going to, Talk to us about making ourselves more independent. All right. All right. So. Bingo. Go ahead. No. I, I just usually say, all right, that was Madison Rising Dangerous. We're going to be talking about Dangerous on Demand. Uh, now. Their free, site is growingresilience.co. Dot co. Dot co. Dot yes. co. Dot so M O U. Dot UK. Todd is with us here. And then Scott, you do, are you co host? What do you do over there at the Growing Resilience podcast? Uh, I make all the jokes. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's that guy. Yep. Uh, awesome. Of course you do. Of it, course you do. And so, then I try to gently integrate them into the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, we're going to take that odd thing that you just said and make it work. <laughs> So, oh, Todd, yeah. give us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I, uh, well, let's see. I've lived my whole life in the western half of the U.S. I've been, um, spent all of my free time as a kid and growing up outside hunting, fishing, whatever it was in the mountains. Um, found myself in Alaska for a number of years. Um, was working in a city and was a professional chef for a long time. And then one day I decided that this was a bad idea. This was about a dozen years ago. I chucked everything, bought a piece of land out in the middle of the woods uh, in the, the northwestern half of the U.S. and lived in a teepee by myself for a couple of years and began this journey that I am, uh, I'm on right now. 
I forgot to mention that Todd is actually coming to us from the teepee, if you can see his background. Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. Actually, it looks like Todd's we're teepee. being set up for a beheading video, actually. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I, I hope not. That's going to be really surprising. Put, for put me a too. sheet up so that the, the, the infidels can't tell where this is coming from. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, the TP is long done at this point. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can Todd's we, terrible we, at making his case. He's uh, terrible about it. The guy lived, the guy lived in a TP uh, in the boonies for years uh, and has since gotten married and uh, has become more civilized, but you know, he grows food, organic food for people uh, for a living and has learned all these lessons the hard way and uh, is a, is a great teacher in on that growing resilience podcast. Todd, Todd tries to help people figure out how to be more resilient, which isn't prepping. It's not just growing food. It's like, you know, what can you do that makes your life um, less subject to outside influence, right? So it's not, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to put up a bunch of MREs in, in the basement and uh, buy a bunch of uh, 223 and be a prepper. It's like, you know, what can I do every single day that makes us less reliant on people who don't care about us? And uh, he's, he's, been, he's been doing that for, for years, and I've been trying to do it now for about two years. In fact, Saturday was two years ago that we moved yeah. out here into the boonies and uh, with no heat and you know started started doing this stuff, uh here so todd's the on the on our podcast todd's the subject matter expert i'm the neophyte i'm learning as i go and i ask the questions and i'm not not just jokes but i also try to uh play the role of the listener who's trying to get started too you know so scott That's did you a much did, better sales did, did, <laughs> thank did, you scott did, that was well done <laughs> you're when welcome you were, when you were growing I like up, you more than you do <laughs> scott when you were growing up did you live in uh, a suburban area would you say it was suburban did your did your parents have a you know did your parents grow food or animals or anything like that uh, uh, we i did i it was not suburban we lived in the boonies it was more rural than where i am now in fact um we, mom and dad weren't big on gardening but we, we did have animals and and i did have to learn a lot of the skills it takes to you know to do this we heated the house with wood um and other stuff. Uh, so, so I was familiar with a lot of these things from, from childhood. Uh, but, but dad had the day job, you know, a town job, you know, and, and they, they, um, they liked the rural life for what it gave us, you know, in terms of like child rearing, you know, the, the experience that we had as kids, they liked it for that. And they also liked it mostly for the buffer. They didn't want to be in town and they didn't want to be around those people. So, that that was their main thing, and that was forty and, uh, years ago. Uh, and that was forty years, years ago. Yeah. So thir- 35, 40 years ago, people were like, "I don't want to be around all these people." And right. I mean, imagine yeah. today. I'm like, yeah. Uh, when when we drive, when we go into the valley where where Jared lives, it doesn't take long before my wife says, "I don't miss this, and I don't want to be around all these people." And I'm over no. here, and I'm like, "Ditto, ditto." <laughs> It's Sunday morning. Why are all these people on the road? Why, you know, why is the highway crowded? But, uh, and, and the reason I asked Scott that is because he said, well, I'm the neophyte. I'm the new guy. And I'm like, and I thought, well, he's selling himself short because you did grow up seeing people. I mean, it's like, there are people today that if you walk them over to a wood stove and ask them what that was, they wouldn't know. Or if you said that's a wood stove and then you left them to their, their alone, they wouldn't know how to light it. They would like put a log in there and hold a big lighter to it until it ran out of fluid. You know, uh, there we have we've grown up or we've raised a generation of people who literally, based upon their their words and actions, have no understanding of basic, you know, of the bottom tier of Maslow's pyramid. Right. Well, fire. You said a warmth. generation. There's been there's probably been three generations of that, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, we all know billions must die. So, you know, that's good. You know, that's fine. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I have an uncle and an aunt, my, my, my dear uncle Henry and aunt Carol, who have been doing this stuff their entire lives. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they buy flour and tobacco and cornmeal and vinegar, uh, at the store and everything else is what they do, you know, and, 
the, there are some of those people out there and I was fortunate enough to learn from some of them. So I guess I'm not a pure, you know, fight, but, uh, I'm definitely in over my head. So that, that's fun. <laughs> it's one way to learn. And I mean, it, it is, it, it is fun. I think it's a constant state of being in over your head though. I mean, this is, this is what it is to, this is part of the idea of resilience is that it is, you're forming habits and it is, I know it's an overused term, but lifestyle, but it really is, it becomes more than a mindset. It's a way you, you have to live. And as a result, you are always interacting with the world and things are changing around you constantly because we don't live in a constant world and you need to adapt all the time. And if you are in those cycles, especially those larger cycles of the natural world, and you're not insulated in suburbia or an urban setting uh, from the man-made, and you are out there, you know, close to, close to the weather or in the weather, you have to be aware of these things and you have to change your behavior and you're constantly learning because every time you think you know, then something else pops up. A fence breaks and the cattle are in the neighbor's field. <clears throat> Or sure. A cold said. snap, a frozen water line, uh, a leak in your roof, uh, a chicken that gets sick all of a sudden, a predator gets in there. Oh, yeah. A flat tire on your truck in the middle of winter, and you can't jack it up because you've got four feet of snow on the ground, and you have to figure that out. I mean, it's all these little things along with the bigger, more what mainstream ideas of growing food and, and filling your root cellar and that sort of thing. Well, we, we, we fall into, as humans, I believe, we, we, we love to label everything, you know, like mm -hmm. prepper. And, and I wrote an article years ago that, like, you know, my mom and my grandma were preppers before that word was invented. <laughs> they, they, weren't, they weren't preppers. They were just humans who understood that, you know what, I bet you everybody in this family is going to want to eat every day. I, right. bet, I bet next month people are going to want to eat. I, I you know, guess. <laughs> I, I'm betting in, in six months, people are probably going to want to eat. So we should take care of that. And, and you know, mm -hmm. every house, when I was a child, every house was built with a pantry or a root cellar or some room that was designated for food storage. You know, not, not, a, not a little tiny spice closet, but every home. Homes were built deliberately with pantries off of the kitchen with root cellars, with, you know, uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, when we, I can't remember what we called it. We had a, the name for the room, uh, the fruit cellar or whatever. But uh, because we used to, as human beings, understand that, you know what? It'd probably be a good idea to have all that stuff in your house all the time and not be completely reliant on grocery stores or food delivery or whatever. That's just how our, our grandparents and parents were raised. It wasn't some weird, you know, oh, you guys are crazy, paranoid preppers. Like, no, we just, that's just life. And, of course, you know, we have to put labels on it. We're like, oh, you're a prepper or you're a, uh, what, what, Scott, you remember the era of the, uh, and maybe you do too, Todd, when in the United States, when they started calling people, quote, survivalists. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, like, those are people that store food in their homes. He's got seven days worth of food in his house. Yeah, they're, they're, he's they're, a survivalist. They're survivalists. <laughs> <Obviously> crazy, man. <laughs> right. Wow. One of the things, one of my favorite things about our audience is we don't have to convince them that this is a good idea to be more resilient, to be more independent. Sure. So what I want to focus on while we have you guys is the how they can mm -hmm. do that. So, uh, uh, and me I, included, I, I would like to learn as well. Right. Um, so assuming, I, let's I see, think the first step, well, let me just talk over you. I'm so <laughs> eager. Perfect. Yeah, let's do it. Now, I, I, I think the first step is for them to, for people to reconsider what, uh, how they, how they think of preparedness. Uh, I'll have Todd can correct me or uh, expand on this, but I think that they need to, they need to reexamine what their threat, what, what the threats are uh, for them and their family. And I think the la if they didn't figure this out from the last three years, then I want to help them understand that, you know, preparing for adverse events isn't about just about food or ammunition or mylar blankets. It's uh, it's also like, do you have too much debt so that if your boss asks you to do something, you can't tell him to stuff it up his ass and quit? 
does is your lifestyle so expensive that you and your wife both have to work 43 hours a week or you won't have a car or a home you know i was thinking they need the to look about at, that when did that start because it hasn't always been that way there used to be a 1971 yeah it's a pretty good spot to peg it <laughs> it started <laughs> in 1971 mm -hmm. uh, that is another show but um oh, dang it. It is. That, that is <laughs> the women's liberation um, movement. We need to get women out of the houses into the workplace so they can pay more taxes and let the government raise their babies. And they close the doll and they close the gold window and, and completely sword the money. And, um, middle class wages have been the same or down every, every single day since then. Mm -hmm. But, I want people to look at their lives and say, you know, what, what do I need to do so that I can exercise more independence and actually act with, as a, you know, with agency. You know, and so if, if your boss asks you to do something unethical or something that's harmful to you, you know, do you have enough money set back? Do you, you know, do you have to get that paycheck or can, or do you have some power? Can you say, I'm not going to do that. I will find another job or if necessary, not have a job for six months. You know, if they ask you to uh, drink the potion and you don't think that's a good idea, can you walk away? Um, you know, well, in June, 2020, they're real. Go clear. ahead. Do you have any quick tips that you could give somebody? Let's say we find a family of people that are in that position where the the mom and the dad have to work 43 hours a week to make their checks. What is one thing that they could do today to get to the point where they don't have to do that? One thing they could do, I, uh, they, they probably need to, uh, listen, this is facile. This is just, you ask the question, I'm going to give an answer and, and this is not nearly enough, but if there's one thing I would say, call, cancel your credit cards and open a new one because that will make any of the recurring services that you pay for on that card flop. Uh, now, if both people are working, you know, times are tough. You know, I said 1971, you know, middle-class wages have pretty much collapsed since then. And that's a fact. And in a lot of places on the, in the country, um, it is just pure math. It's very, very difficult for the average person to run a home on one salary. But, you know, get, get rid of those recurring expenses would be the first thing I would say. And, uh, and you may, you know, cancel those credit cards and, and, you know, open another one. I'm not telling you to not use credit cards, but you shouldn't, but do that. And you might also, uh, um, uh, call your bank and ask them what you can do to just slam all automatic ACH drafts on your account as well. But, um, that's just one thing. And I don't know, that shouldn't take you but about 10 minutes to do that. Uh, but there are a whole lot of things that if people are in a situation where they have to have two incomes to get by, they, they have to change their lives. And here's the thing. You can either change your life now because you are choosing to do so and you are trying to control it, or you, you can do it when it hits the fan and the dollar collapses because they're trying to do that, you know? So, so get ahead of it, get ahead of it. Yeah. So the resilience, you need, you know, Todd, Todd, I talk to Todd on the phone almost every day. And we talk about, we talk about everything. Um, but you know, if I'm, if I'm buying a tool or a piece of equipment, you know, Todd always asks, you know, is that something you can fix? Can we get parts for this? You know, what, what is this? Um, so you, you need to, you know, if you buy something, do you, if you can't fix it, you don't really own it. Uh, if you can't get parts for it, it's a waste of your time, you know? So, you know, when you buy something, does it make you more dependent on people inside or outside of your circle? You know, so looking at resilience in a more broad way is what is what we try to get people to do. But we end up talking about gardening and farming stuff a lot, but there's more to it than that. And I think we're on episode 34 of this show. And as we keep going, I want to talk about more and more things. You know, are you truly resilient if you send your kids to the government school? Are you truly resilient <laughs> If uh, you have a mortgage and the mortgage company tells you what kind of insurance you have to have, are you truly resilient? Um, if, uh, if all of the stuff you have is made out of plastic and you can't repair it, are you truly resilient? If you don't have a table saw, I don't know. 
you know, <laughs> need to think about them. I don't know. I think the base, what, what Scott's saying, and for me, where I start from is simplify. You need to strip your life down to, to a human level. We live in a world that is being dictated to us by what machines or the machine, modernity, whatever you want to call it, the combine, the technium, that is what is directing people now. And that is what has changed this this grand story that we are living in for the last, what, two, three generations, three generations, really, but it's, it's gone awfully fast the last two and really stepped on the gas the last three, four years. If you can't live, if you can't take things away from your life, meaning you can't simplify, strip away the superfluous, get down to the, the, what the actions, the engagements, and even the hard goods that you have around you um, that you are said most hard basic. goods. <laughs> I did. <laughs> See, there you go. That's what he does on the show a lot of the time. Um, but you need to be able to find what a state of, it's not less, but I do want to say it's a state of less than where you are right now. But again, it's, it's a simplicity that frees you from the confusion and the clutter and the noise of modernity. And you can't actually be resilient from any of these things or from, from all of these outside attachments until you can quiet that input down a little bit and think about where you are and where you would like to go. Not what you're running from, but actually what you want to move toward. I like that. that I think it's... is what where where true resilience is coming from because at that point it puts you into a mind state where you can become flexible. You understand your home. You actually know what you own. You understand the systems of your home. You understand your 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 relationships either within your community of friends or or your tribe, whatever it is that you know how you interact with each other. They give to you. You give to them. You understand how to fix the things you have around you. You know how to actually live like a human is supposed to live, which is fully engaged with the world around you. Yeah. And that, you know, I think a, a lot of the reason that <laughs> society is the way that it is right now is because people make fear-based decisions a lot. Sure. And the way that you just frame that is you're, you're helping people focus more on a positive outcome rather than running away from something that, they don't even know really what it is, but they're afraid of it. And that's important for the human psyche is making fear-based decisions is not a good idea. So pick something that's positive, this outcome that you want to have. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, you've been doing a great job at this. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that journey, but um, the focusing on a positive outcome, the way you, you want to live and then make that happen. Uh, call we were talking, Todd and I were talking the other day on the phone about Pascal's wager. You know, Pascal's wager, he says, he says, you know, if there's a God and you don't act in a godly way, then you will suffer in the afterlife. Yeah. But if you act in a godly way and there's no God, there's no doubt. Pretty good insurance. Yeah. Good insurance, you know? Well, <laughs> if you act in a resilient way and you never need it, that's Todd's wager, right? Like you act in a resilient <laughs> way and you never really needed it. Then you just ended up being resilient and th good, good for you. The, sh you know, the, it, the, the turds did not hit the fan, but, but it's, it's not that clear. You know, you said, Jared, that, you know, the people, that there's, that there's pressure for people to live in this less resilient way. And, um, and then you said, you know, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Um, we left a great number of comforts behind us. This is a much more difficult, a much more uncomfortable way to live. We sold our nice uh, mid-century modern house, the saltwater pool over by the country club um, uh, about three years ago. And then um, two years ago, we moved into this building that we heat with wood Um and it's too big to heat with wood, with wood by the way. It's basically a barn. I haven't been to Scott's place. It's a, it's basically a, a barn shop. It's got some uh, living quarters in it. And it's a, uh, it, it was when we went there, I was very proud of the decisions that you made. Cause you could have done anything. You really could have done anything, man. And you chose to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to be, uh, 
thrifty, you wanted to be resilient, whatever, right? Um, so, 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 you know, if, if some sort of event is coming that would cause you to wish you were more resilient, the only way to prepare for that is really to kind of prepay for that suffering. <laughs> nobody wants to hear this. And this is why nobody does it. It's voluntary You're going hardship. You're to prepay that. Say that again, sir. It's voluntary hardship. But it's well, voluntary it, hardship with a, you, you, there's a reason for doing it. Voluntary hardship to me seems like a way for an urban person to try to bring some sort of physical meaning to their life. It's, it doesn't actually have a goal. It's suffering for the sake of suffering and saying, look how I've learned from suffering. It's like, well, why don't you put that effort and suffering into <laughs> building something instead? Because what you're doing is you're, I mean, it's almost playing into that same mindset of this seemingly artificial fake world that we live in. So many things that we hear and see. So, so Todd, then Todd if you is, buy into that. Todd's not a, he's not a, a, a block disciple because when I said voluntary hardship, that's that's what when you're building your body, the only mm -hmm. way you can strengthen your body is to engage in voluntary hardship, because if you do what is easy sure. and what is comfortable, you will never be strong because being strong sure. doesn't come from easy and comfortable. Being strong comes from willingly. Now, when I was in the Marine Corps, it was involuntary hardship. It was still good. <laughs> it was still valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you go to basic training in infantry school and when you are, are in the infantry, you are, you engage in involuntary hardship. You don't have a choice, but most humans in the world and see that, and that is the difficult, that's the difficult task that I find myself in is how do you take the normies? How do you get the normies into the right mindset? If I had a group of people, if I was a drill instructor or if I was a platoon sergeant or whatever I could tell those people this is what we're going to do you might not understand it you might not like it but it's important and this is what we're going to do but for the normies you see how do you convince the normies to no. willingly engage in voluntary hardship when they've never had to and when they're actually convinced that if things are difficult, if things are uncomfortable, if you're mentally uncomfortable or physically uncomfortable, that means someone has done something wrong to you. And, and you know, mm -hmm. mental discomfort and physical discomfort are, are wrong and should be avoided at all times. How do you, or, or can we, or can you not even convince those people? I don't think can you can. Virtue, Socrates, <laughs> yeah. can virtue be taught? <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, that 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 voluntary hardship idea comes from Matt Reynolds at Barbell Logic, and Matt's a beloved friend of mine. And I agree with the sentiments behind that, but it's not quite complete. That idea, you know, Matt is a Calvinist. I wish he was on here for me to berate publicly, not for, <laughs> not so he could defend himself because he can't, but uh, just just <laughs> you know, just to make it fun, you know. There is not value in pure mortification of the body, in my opinion. Right. The voluntary hardship thing conveys an idea to people. It's great rhetoric, right? It's a great way to convince the office worker that he needs to do something such that he makes his body more resilient. It's going to hurt to squat heavy and get stronger. Um, there is a payoff. It is a transaction. We're doing something for a payoff. We're not doing it just for its own sake. Now, Matt would say, you know, we do it for its own sake. No, we don't. We do it for its benefits, right? We um, we squat heavy so that if we have to pull somebody out of a burning building, not only are we stronger, we're more willing to to we we are have a you know inured ourselves to the to the pain, and we 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 develop a, a kind of courage under the bar. Actually, well. This to become more resilient, you're going to pay. You're going to pay a price. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's it's for real. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to make anybody think I'm tough as hell or anything about it. But you will. You know. You you're um, you're going to pay a financial price. You're going to pay a societal price. People think I'm nuts. I am nuts, but they don't know why. They don't. They 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 think I'm nuts for all the wrong reasons. Uh, it's harder. 
it's harder. You're going to live in a smaller house. Um, you're going to have fewer material comforts. You will uh, eat out less. I mean, I could just go on and on and on. And, and um, you know, for married people, well, it's hard to get mama to do it. It's hard to get mama to pay the pay to prepay the suffering. You know, you can be more resilient now and suffer a little bit now, or you can so- suffer ultimately and terminally, you know, when, when it all goes bad. And uh, it's really hard to get people to do that, to have that time preference where they will suffer a little now to avoid great suffering that could happen in the future. Dwyer's wager. Well, and we also have to, you know, you say, well, it's, it's that hardship. It's incomplete. Of course it's incomplete. It's incomplete because you cannot explain, uh, trigonometry to a five-year-old. You, you, you can teach a five-year-old two plus two, right? Now you say, but in the future, you're going to want to know trigonometry. And this is very important or your geometry or whatever, but it, right. it's a waste of time to tell a guy these are the overarching. This this is the, the you know you're going to quote Socrates to a dude who thinks TikTok is the height of intelligence, you know, or or is the height of entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the you know, and I, we talked recently, uh, and, and I know I know that you know Mark Ripito and Mark Ripito, uh, our our good friend Jeff Kirkham just shared a a short clip of Ripito talking about what it takes to get bigger. People are like, I want to get bigger. And he goes, you want to get bigger? He goes, do reps of five. And he goes, and add five pounds every time until you, and he goes, you will become bigger. And people jumped in there because humans are, are, are terrible uh, and uh, should be extinct. But people jumped in and they're like, ah, oh, that's a, a gross oversimplification. It's far more complex than that. I'm like, calm down, moron. You have to master the simple before you can understand the complex. The idea that we can say, sure. and that is, see, that is the, the tool of our enemy. The tool of our enemy is to tell us, you don't understand. It's more complicated than that. It's more complex than that. It's more involved than that. When you say, you know what? We should not groom children to be sodomites. That's wrong. That is bad. We should not sexualize our children. Oh, no, there's an overarching societal. No, 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 no. There's no overarching societal anything. It's very simple. And the tool of our enemy is to get us to give up. Like, sure. Well, it's complicated. It's complex. It's, it's more than your little tiny brain can handle. So just surrender. Do mm-hmm. nothing. And, or not, it's not do nothing. Do what you're told. And everybody will be happy. So we have to be careful when we, we say, well, well, it's more com- complicated than that. Yes, it is more complicated than that. But until we get someone to master and grasp the simple, we're wasting our time trying to explain, explain the complex. At least that's what I believe. Yeah. Yeah, the voluntary hardship thing is perfect rhetoric, you know, to get somebody to, you know, undertake physical training. And uh, and I think I think Dwyer's wager is too. You know, you're, you you know, you, you need to be thing. more resilient. Who could argue with that? Like, what's the downside in being more resilient? Yeah, there's none. Uh, there's none. Everything, you know, the the food you grow, for instance, will take something nice and simple. Instead of filling your basement or your garage with freeze-dried food, which essentially nobody wants to eat, you know, unless, unless the situation is dire or you're on, you know, you have to carry it somewhere a great distance. But otherwise, you don't want to eat it, and it's not all that good for you. It'll keep you alive, but that's that's essentially its purpose. If you instead have a life where you are growing food that you enjoy to eat and you know how to preserve half a dozen things, or just like how to store your own potatoes, put some of your own garlic away, save some onions for yourself and eat your own onions during the winter, something really simple. And you find something that you can integrate into your life seamlessly. It's not, it doesn't feel a struggle and you don't even feel like you're really doing anything unusual and you're not, all you're doing is you're living and you're supporting your own life that you wanted to live before. And now as you begin to build on these practices, before you know it, you can actually start severing those connections that have been holding you back either financially or your, your mind space for how you want to think, engage in whatever spiritual practice you have, be with your family, do other things that have more meaning to you. This is a part of it 
this is a part of the, if you, if you are truly being resilient with who you are and the life you want to live, yeah, you, there is no downside. You can't lose because all you're doing is you're just doing something additive to your own life all the time. Yes. You don't we, have we, to make fear-based decisions ever. You can always make the, the decision with the positive outcome in mind too. You're on your heels if you're, if you're coming from fear, right? And for anyone who's ever been in a fight or trained martial arts, anything like that, being on your heels is the worst place to be to make decisions. You know, and another common for, phrase that a lot of people listening to the show are going to understand is the OODA loop, right? If you're on your heels, all of a sudden your OODA loop's busted and you cannot decide what's going to happen next. Your observe, orient, decide, act is all f- sort and there's nothing you can do with it. But if you are moving towards something, you are proactive and you have a goal in mind and your goal is say in that case is to go through that threat or in this case, your goal is to move towards what you want to be. Now, all of a sudden, you're stretching out that OODA loop into a way of looking at life. You're observing what's going around you. You're orienting about what's happening. You're deciding about how you're going to act and then you're going to act. You're not going to think about it anymore. You're not going to twiddle your thumbs. You're not going to sit online and just research the daylights out of it and keep buying books and buy a bunch of stuff and tools and things that you don't know how to use and don't have any bearing in your life because you feel like you're acting because you're spending money and you're buying shit to put in your whatever, in your storage unit. And then all of a sudden you've actually created more dependency on this thing that you're trying to get away from because you fell for the trick the machine is telling you. <laughs> we, we've been saying on our show, like for how many years, Jared? Self-sufficiency okay. is never a bad idea. No. <laughs> there, it, it's never a bad idea. You're like, well, what if, what if, I'm, if I'm super self-sufficient and I store all this food? What are we going to do with it? Eat it. Give it to your friends. Uh, you know, um, uh, Wheat, wheat berries, honey. Yeah, I wrote an article and I, and it's gone. It, it, it's gone in the ether, but uh, I think in 2014, seven foods, and, and I just did the research and put it into my own words, but seven foods that will outlive you, right? Mm-hmm. We all know about, about the pharaohs or the pyramids, but them going down in there and finding edible honey, you know, uh, jars of sealed jars of wheat and so on and so forth. You know, Kirkham did a thing. Jared, you remember when, when Jeff, they found 50 year old wheat and they ground it up and made bread out of it just because they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things people's like, well, what are we going to do with this? I had a friend of mine. He said his, uh, his wife looked and she goes, what are we going to do with all this, this food and stuff? And he said, we're going to eat it. And if we don't, we'll give it to our kids, but it's never, it's never a bad thing to, engage in self-sufficiency, whether that's learning how to repair your own vehicle, whether it's learning how to repair your own house, whether, you know, it's learning how to grow your own food. That's, there's no downside to that. The only downside is if you are an entity that wants people to be controllable, that's that. And, you know, we could talk about, we could talk about electronic cars. Um, I just I just saw an, an actual interview with a guy. It was a clip for, of an interview, and he said humans. And he goes, all these green people do not. He goes, they think that electricity is energy, and anything that can produce electricity is energy. He said, but the windmill farms. He goes, you see those windmills? He said the factories where those were made were made with fossil fuels. He goes, those factories were not run by windmills. Those factories were not, he said, the solar panels that everyone loves to worship were made with fossil fuels, both with fossil fuels are in them and they were made in factories that used fossil fuels to produce energy. Look at the electric car. We just talked to Jared and I had a conversation about this, about how the electric car has to constantly be, it has to be Wi-Fi or hooked up to the web or whatever and uh, if, if you keep paying your fee, you can rapid charge it. But if you, if you stop paying the fee, then it takes eight hours to charge your car. Why would you want that? Why would people want you to be in a vehicle that be, could be remotely shut off versus a 1982 Dodge Power Wagon that no one can touch and will actually survive well, an EMP? Well, everything is trying, uh, all businesses, all of them, including mine, onlinegreatbooks.com, where we help you read the great books. 
uh, are trying to turn everything into a subscription. So if they can turn your John Deere tractor into a subscription or a software package or your automobile, they're going to do that because they smooth out their revenue curve and all that. Uh, you're right about this energy thing and the whole green thing, but let me lay, let me tell you another one. Because you, you asked a while ago, how do we get normies to do this? You, you can't. I said billions right. must die. Somebody has to step up and volunteer to be one of the billions. I'm all for it because I plan on fertilizing with them. So I'm all for it. But if you already think that there's a problem and you need to do something and you want to be more resilient, um, being concerned about the, this sort of green movement, I understand. But here's something that a lot of people don't know. You can go see, you can go verify these numbers in all kinds of places. You have Schumacher's books, uh, um, uh, Jim Garrish's books, you know, uh, I think the United States Department of Agriculture even says this. Right now in the United States, it takes about 17 calories to get one calorie of food out of the ground. Bad trade. So we have to we have to burn natural gas to make nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel fuel to get it from the co-op to, you know, well, from the plant to the co-op, from the co-op to your farm, from the farm onto the, into the sprayer, into the trip, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. right? We are losing 16 calories for every calorie that we're consuming. And so basically this, these 8 billion people teaming over the face of the earth are being subsidized by a terrible thermodynamic bargain where we burn 17 calories worth of uh, carbons, natural gas, others, to get a calorie of food into somebody's mouth. You tell me, I don't care who you are or what you think about fracking or whatever, how long can we make such a bad bargain? I don't know. Um, we have been making that bad bargain far longer than I thought we could. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been thinking the sky was falling since about 74 when I was born <laughs> and I've fucking been wrong at every turn though things are getting more difficult and becoming more weary and weirder I, every day. Uh, I used to think that everything was going to collapse. Like somebody broke, broke a glass rod, like it was binary, mm -hmm. you know? I don't think that's the case anymore. I think we're going to become a third world country with snow and things are going to become grindingly difficult. Uh, simple things will become much more expensive than they were. But you're talking about a what a bad thermodynamic bargain a windmill is because of all the petroleum you have to burn to build the windmill in order to harvest less energy than the petroleum that built it represents. Every fucking calorie at the store is a worse deal than the fucking windmill. Slow down. You're going to, you're, you're, you're slow down with the F-bombs because you're, you, Zach is, he can't keep up. No. <laughs> oh, where's, we're, we're bleeping things. Oh yeah. We're, this is the public show. Jared told you at the beginning, but you disregarded him. Uh, <laughs> I don't listen to Jared. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like Alex. He's like, shut the door. And I just walk out. <laughs> she she was trying really hard to shut the door but she had a baby and something else in her hand there, there is no try the door is either shut or it is not there's there no, there no try, try. Yeah. Do. well but yeah, yeah. oh i, I are you are, can i ask your store yep. is in the death spiral no it's not i just all right you're a you're a paranoid conspiracy theorist and i was just at my store and the shelves were full and you don't know what you're talking about that's right uh well Todd, let me ask you, let me ask this question directly to Todd. <laughs> Todd, are you familiar with the uh, the model that the, uh, the the former king of Thailand uh, created to keep their, their people from starving? Essentially, rice in every field and, and fish in every pond. Are you familiar with that? Vaguely, but I would love to hear you describe it better because you sound much more intimately familiar with it. Well, actually, uh, you, knew, uh, you guys know who Michael Yan is? Michael Yan is a former Green Beret who became a, uh, it's, it's Y-A-N, uh, or is it Y-O-N, Y-O-N, Michael Yan. Um, but, but he, uh, it's not J like, like the German, it's with a Y. But uh, he, he's a former Green Beret who became a, uh, a journalist, and his thing is basically traveling all around the world um, and, and talking to people. 
and, and he's been you know he's been putting out a series of, of podcasts and articles and so on and so forth and he's extremely concerned that uh, we're we're going to we're going into a worldwide famine stage because exactly what uh what Scott said because we've become so hyper reliant upon fertilizers and you have countries that grow tons of food but they produce no fertilizer so when you're a country that produces lots of food, but you have to get all your fertilizer from Germany, and then Germany shuts down their plants for four months because they can't afford to run them, they can't keep the plants open, so they're like, you know what, we're going to put everybody on a four-month vacation, we're going to make nothing. What happens to next year's food production? Anyway, Jan talked about how, he, and he's very familiar with Thailand, he lives in Thailand part-time, uh, the king of Thailand saw famine coming. And they always, and so he imported tilapia. He went to Japan and he met with the emperor of Japan and he gifted him these tilapia. And they, and they grew them and because they were a tremendous source of protein. And what he did is they essentially created a model rather than the collective, you know, the, the collective or the centralized farm or whatever. What do we know about collectivization? Every time a country whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether you know, you name it, decides that they're going to centralize food production or collectivize food production, the result is famine. It always is. Historically, when you put the government in charge of food production, people die by the millions. And so what the king in Thailand did, he said, this is what we're going to do. Every region, every state, every village is going to be responsible for its own food production. And here is the model. And it's very specific. It's a very specific and detailed plan. It's like if you have 10 hectares or acres or whatever they call them in Thailand, he said, this is how much you need to devote to food production or grain production or rice production. This is how much you need to produce. You know, everyone should have a pond. And, they, and now they produce like literally hundreds of millions of tons of protein for, from the tilapia. And I think he was, they, the Japanese sent him like 50 fish and 40 died in route. And so they took 10 and they grew the 10 and then they grew hundreds and they grew thousands and then they gave them to the people. But essentially the model that the, that the, the and the, he was beloved, this, the former king was like, look, we have to stop looking towards centralization and we need to get back to people controlling their own production and that's essentially fish in every pond and, and rice in every field and would you say well, that's that, not how you control people no you don't control people <laughs> like that. well he was a dummy that's a listening. terrible model for a government <laughs> yeah what was he thinking well he was a king yeah maybe that's what he was thinking. maybe that's he why. was a king you had a monarchy so that's you have a monarchy in that situation you have a homogenous culture you have a uh oh that's true you have a, you have a relatively homogenous or homogenous culture you have a homogenous uh religious or sacred system for the country and you have a monarchy and you combine all those three things together and it can be very very easy to get people all on the same page and you can introduce a, a, a way of acting and a way of viewing the world that can be incorporated quickly and readily and supported when you have a very large population that doesn't have connections to each other. The I'm way we've so separated each other too, in particular, the last several years with this medium that we're connecting over, this has created even greater separation from people. Now you've put people into, you've put people into, into independent actors acting independently. And this even falls back on the idea of what is self-sufficient. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as self-sufficient. Self-sufficient is, is actually is the myth of the lone wolf. It just means you're going to die. It might be glorious until you die, but you're going to end up like the mountain men in the 19th century, 18th century, who, you know, if they made it to the 32nd birthday, they were doing all right. That's what self-sufficiency looks like. The idea is that you need to create behaviors and skills in your own life that will blend with the behaviors and skills of others. And together you can actually build something, but there needs to be something like a, like that is a, keeping like you down team, together. Like a, like a Patriot. Precisely team. like a team, precisely like a team. And it doesn't have to be. And again, these are, 
you're building skills. It's a mindset and it's a skill set. It's not a thing set. I mean, the things are important too. You have to have tools to do the things you want to do. And that's fine. You know, properly applied technology, properly applied technique. This is an important part, but skills are non-perishable. They're transferable, they're tradable, and they're generative as is a good mindset. So if you actually start there and start small and just begin building off of it with patience, with discipline, and with daily habit of applying these skills and techniques and mindset, you actually can create more autonomy. And I say autonomy, again, not self-sufficiency, an ability to stand on your own, but to stand in strength and be able to interact with other people in a position of strength, as opposed to one of taking or taking, you know, taking or someone taking from you. Scott, the, uh, the tie model is actually mighty good. Um, there's a book, I, I'm going to forget the author, but Todd can fill it in. It's called The One Straw Revolution. Masanobu Fukuoka. There Mushu. you go. And he, he talks about um, something very similar to this. Uh, the, the rice paddy carp oxen triumvirate uh, works a treat uh, mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia. Um, you've got a ruminant animal pooping in that rice paddy. You've got a carp in that rice paddy uh, creating nitrogenous waste and eating, uh, eating some of the uh, detritus off of the rice. And then you can harvest the rice. You can eat the carp. You can eat the ox. You get horsepower out of the ox. Everything's great doesn't work here but you know what we got stuff that does work here up until about 1920 the north it, american it and western european farm had mm -hmm. a model mm -hmm. thank you, you thank a, you yep. you had a model where you had an animal with a gizzard you had chickens um you have an omnivore you have a pig and you have ruminant animals whether it's goat sheep or cattle and and then you garden and you can feed waste off of your table uh, and garden waste to the chickens or the pigs. Uh, you can take milk from the cow, make products for yourself, feed the waste from that, like the skim milk, the buttermilk, the waste from that to the pigs. And um, if you're careful, if you're careful, you can leave your, your soil and your farm and your family better every day. Yep. With that model. And you can do it with the rice paddy oxen carp model. But we had one in Europe and we had one in North America. And we destroyed and everybody it. Threw it off. They destroyed it. They destroyed it Fiber. on purpose. They went, Absolutely. You remember when the, uh, when the government started paying people to not grow food? When the government, when oh, the I USDA know. decided mm -hmm. we're going to pay people, you, we're going to take. We're going to steal money from these people, and we're going to give it to farmers and tell them, don't grow food. We'll pay you not to grow. And then we decided, well, and what did they do? They got them addicted to that money. They, you, they, you know, humans are humans, and sometimes humans are st stupid and weak. So they, they became reliant upon that money as income. Then the government came around and said, you know what? Program's over. <laughs> Cancel on that. And they're like, yeah, but I've got you know, a million dollar John Deere and I got, I got loans and they're like, oh, well, don't sweat it. When the bank forecloses on your farm, the Agco will hire you as an employee to run that farm. And we're not, and you used to have cows and pigs and corn and wheat on your farm. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to get rid of all that. We're going to grow all corn. So you're going to be a specialist. You're going to have only corn on this farm. And we're like, well, how are we going to do that? We don't have any cow manure. We used to take the cow manure, spray it onto the fields, grow the corn. Well, so don't don't worry about it. We've got fertilizer, artificial fertilizers that we make. We'll truck in the artificial fertilizers. But wouldn't it be better if we had and see Scott that you we had that system in America, where people farmers knew you don't just farm wheat and nothing else. You don't just raise pigs and nothing else. You have a little bit of everything. And we knew that as humans for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We knew that. We knew it was a good idea. And then we allowed the smart people in Washington, D.C. or wherever to convince us that that wasn't a good idea anymore. 
And here we well, are. And it's not just. It's not and just it's coming. It's government. coming back too. It's not just central planning, but the ideas are also coming back. Uh, it's it. Fortunately, it's not dead. I mean, to. And Paul, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying, and I agree. And in addition, with the regenerative agriculture movement now, these skill sets have not been lost. People are actually trying to bring this back, and they're saying, "Look, we have we have a broken model." And even people that don't want to pay much attention to what modern agriculture looks like, they can still get the sense that I don't think this is all that smart. That doesn't look like a good idea. Why are we putting these toxic substances over and over and over again into the land, killing it or, or degrading it even further every single year? So the food that's coming out is degrading the health of all the humans and the animals that are eating it. And this, we're on this downward spiral. So how do we stop that? And one of those ways is that returning to these old methods that we do know that work, but of course, now you can give it a new name. People have a new way of looking at it. They call it regenerative agriculture and it's doing the exact same thing. It's bringing back old models applied in a modern world. And how can we incorporate the new and the old together in a way that will actually bring about this change that we want? that we need. Actually, it's not one. We do need this. How long are we going to go? <laughs> yeah, we're today? Zach, just give us oh, a uh, general. We're no, going. We're, we are closing in on an hour. Now. Yeah, we're closing in on an hour. Right but, now. but how long are we going to go? Uh, approximately oh, an hour. Until we oh. uh, <laughs> ease it all out. Of until you every oh, single man. human agrees with us. Yes. Uh, oh, well, we, so, I don't want them to agree. Well, like I said, huh? we need billions for compost. Build a wall. There with the need bodies to be the people dead. that don't get it. Oh, I, I don't think there's any problem with that, Scott. Uh, not, not with your audience. No. Um, well, since we're coming to an end, there are a few things. If people want to increase their resilience, I think um, they should listen to our podcast, Growing Resilience Podcast. Um, you can go check out Todd's website, GrowingResilience.co. There's some, and there's some stuff you might want to read. There's a, there's an old book by a guy named Edmund Morris. It's called Ten Acres Enough. This guy leaves Pennsylvania in the 1850s. He leaves Philadelphia in the 1850s, and does it. Times are different, but he shows you what the old model was. Mm -hmm. You know, he's composting. He's using compost tea. Uh, they're a closed system. He has a chapter called. Uh, uh, what is it? The, the, the queen of the farmstead, I think, where it's about his dairy cow and how much he loves his dairy cow. You know, that book will show you what it was. We can still do it. It has to be a little different than that, but it's a, it's a delight to read. I highly recommend it. Go read the Little House on the Prairie books, all of them, except Farmer Boy. Uh, the Cottage Economy by William Cobbett is top notch. Mm-hmm. Um, where he's writing about uh, the old meat ways and, um, um, and, and butchery and animal husbandry in England in the 1600s. Fantastic. A lot to learn from that. Acres USA Magazine's top notch. Uh, uh, tells you what large-scale regenerative farming looks like, mostly. There's some stuff in there about the smallholder, but mostly about large-scale, and there's a lot to be learned there. Um, I love the Stockman Grass Farmer Magazine. Uh, for people who want to practice um, grazing and uh, growing ruminant animals without grain, where well, where we all know that we're not cattlemen, we're grass farmers who happen to turn grass into protein. Um, yeah, I highly recommend those things. The Fox Fire series of books. That's wonderful. Yeah. How did you forget so that, Scott? That, that's your, <laughs> your holy grail, man. So good. Yeah, so good. And if you're looking for technique on, you know, we haven't really touched on it today, but if you if you're looking for techniques and ways to grow vegetables to from and you can apply this in a back garden to market gardener. You know, I'm a I'm a I grow on I'm I'm a I'm a market gardener, meaning I'm growing everything. I grow organic vegetables, not certified because I don't want to participate in that. So I actually am way beyond what organic standards would be. Um, everything is grown with hand tools. I don't till the soil, so it's also considered no till. So I'm not breaking up that soil structure and causing the damage the tillage causes to the soil. It's a broad fork. That's my tilling tool. It just cracks the soil and that's it. Um, but there's the book to have for knowing how to garden is The New Organic Grower uh, by Elliot Coleman. It's if you if you want just one that will tell you how to do it, that one will do it. There's some other great ones out there. And again, it's it, uh, The Market Gardener by J.M. Fortier, also a wonderful, wonderful book. 
aimed at a market gardener, but again, you can scale that down to a backyard to your, your planter boxes. It still makes sense. It's all the same technique applied to different scales. There you go. And gardening when it counts with Steve Solomon. <laughs> we could go yes. on and on. Well, well there's so much out there. <laughs> the primary purpose of this. So now you've got one. Yeah. The <laughs> primary purpose of this is, is inspiration. That's all. Yeah. That's all we're doing. We're just providing you inspiration. Um, yeah. So we've got step one for you guys is what we talked about today. We didn't get any further than that, but step one is reframe the way that you think about preparedness. Ask yourself the question, what do I need to do to exercise more independence? Some of the tips that Scott gave were financial independence, get rid of recurring expenses by and one easy way to do that is to cancel your credit cards and open a new one or don't open one. If you don't need one, call bank and ask, what you can do to cancel all your recurring ACH transactions. And then um, I think something that Todd said was when you buy something that you can't fix, it's not really yours. And I think that's a, a profound statement because it's very true. And it's something that we don't think about. You know, we have all these things nowadays. Technology has allowed us to create a lot of things, but we are losing as a, as a humanity. I think we're losing the skills to fix those things because if you look at vehicles, for instance, they keep getting more complicated and more complicated and more complicated. Things that we could have fixed by ourselves easily, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Nowadays, you're like, I can't even fit in that compartment. I need to take my entire engine apart to get to that sensor that I need to replace right there. Uh, and so it's not sustainable for us. And really the overall thing that we're talking about here is simplifying life in general. You guys disagree with any of that? No. Nope. <laughs> oh, and turn off the damn internet. Unless you're yeah, listening really, to mean, us. To a point, to a point, yeah. I mean, like, like you said, okay, how about this is better. Use, use what is available right now wisely and do it in a way that is intentional. If you are just, whatever that is, if you're shoving food in your face and not thinking about it, you're going to have meta meta metabolic problems. If you are behaving in ways where you're not considering your actions, you're going to end up creating problems for yourself and suffering. This involves interacting with technology and you have to have that space in your life. You have to have that space in your head to think about what it is to be resilient and even get the conception of what is it to simplify when all the voices coming in are telling you, no, 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 you need more, more, more. You cannot do that unless you can quiet that down a little bit. Put your phone away and play an instrument. Mm, perfect put your phone perfect. away and pick up your guitar or piano or whatever yep so i was or researching the mama. college economy and it seems that there's a bunch of different ones or do you recommend all of them or is there one in particular no uh it's william cobbett i believe is that one is the one uh, that i'm talking about cottage economy that sounds right c-o-b-b-e-t-t -T? yep yep okay. that's him yeah, 1821. I thought it was 1600s. 1821. He's got recipes for baking bread, brewing beer, uh, advice on butchery. Uh, it's about the cottage economy, right? Like how the smallholder in Regency era England could actually have a business from their cottage. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not this, it's not this sort of cottage industry thing where mom is like knitting sweaters in her spare time that we were told about in the American history textbooks. It's making the homestead, the farmstead, a, a profitable enterprise. And it's a crying ass shame that we have to look at books that are 202 years old to get some sort of guidance on this, but that's where we have to look. And then we have to update from there. <sighs> all right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, children yeah. of all ages, let's thank Scott and Todd for taking the time out of their day to be with us. Uh, let's make sure that we're going to the, uh, growingresilience.co it's growingresilience.co.uk.mous uh, no no <laughs> don't throw in that uk <laughs> uh, .co.uk.mous you got to get Todd back on here to talk about something that was touched on earlier in the episode was that he lived in a teepee but got married during that time so that is fascinating i'm not going to tell you that story uh, well, <laughs> well maybe I'll, I'll, it, I'll talk about I'll it. I'll probably tell it. Yeah. You know, uh. Think about it. Like, what if you're a guy and you live in a teepee for real? It was for real. For real. And you go, you go to town. Now, that's going to turn off a lot of chicks. 
but there's a cohort basement flooded. Like, how could you not win? <laughs> there's a certain chick that's like, you live in a TP? I want to live in a TP. <laughs> Are and we they allowed to play Tarzan and Jane? You're yeah. going to win yeah. with that cohort. Yeah, there and, you and go. It's good to sort out the other one. Absolutely. Hey guys, please listen to our podcast. We bust our ass and I hope it's good. It's the Growing Resilience Podcast. We're going to make you think about how to be more resilient. We're going to land some jokes. We talk a little bit of philosophy. There's going to be something in there that's interesting. And uh, we're always, Todd's always offering new little white papers and gimmies there where if you email him, he'll send you his uh, uh, Make Your Hole Ready tree planting guide uh and and the like so uh listen to the show we'll try to help you along all we, right we, we can, of uh, uh, one of our, it shouldn't be did you say make your hole ready tree planting guide <laughs> yeah that's, that's right <laughs> okay uh like our that. buddy that's damon uh, damon's down with that damon aren't you he's like yeah he goes dude exactly it all starts with a hole all right yeah. uh, and and let's not forget about uh online great books uh, go mm. ahead and, and follow online great books. If you want to learn how to think, if you just want to actually think and engage your brain and use that gray matter uh, for something other than a sponge, uh, online great books or OGB. That's yeah, uh, thanks. That's right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that that inspired you. If that discussion did not inspire you to move forward and to be resilient then I don't know if you can be inspired. I, I guess come back again later and we'll try again one more time. But uh, yeah, thank you uh, once again to our guests for taking the time out of their day uh, to do that. And for, you know, a lot of these guys who have knowledge, we, we are indebted to them for taking that knowledge and experience and making it available to us. Because they don't have to. You know, no one's making them do it. We're going to be back tomorrow with a grad program bonus hour. If you'd like to be part of the grad program and get the bonus hours, be part of the insider group, that's great. We'd love for you to be there. Jared or Zach, whoever wants to tell them, how can they be a member of the grad program? Well, step one, you go to getsotg.com to join the grad program, get in on trial. Step two, you unmute yourself. And then with step three, Jared. Uh, get sotg.com follow the instructions yeah there you go get sotg.com and remember ladies and gentlemen gentlemen and ladies you're a beginner once you're a student for life thanks for staying until the end want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like rating or review it makes a big difference have a show topic submission we would love to hear it Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com.